रूपेश को अब तक तीन केसों में फंसाया जा चुका है दो झारखंड के एक दो जिलों का है एक सरायकेला खरसावा का दूसरा बोकारो का और तीसरा केस बिहार के रोहतास जिले का है आखिर क्या कारण है जो एक पत्रकार से सरकार इतनी डर गई है झारखंड एक ऐसा राज्य है जो खनिज संपदा से भरपूर है जहां अब तक सैकड़ों एम साइन किए जा चुके हैं और आए दिन साइन होते रहते हैं और सरकार पूंजीपतियों को जमीन दिलाने के लिए यहाँ के आदिवासी मूलवासी विस्थापितों पर आए दिन दमन करती रहती है यहाँ जो भी सरकार आती है जब वो विपक्ष में रहती है तो इसी आदिवासी मूलवासी विस्थापितों के खुद को उनका हित हित कर बताती है लेकिन कुर्सी पाते इन्हीं पर दमन चालू कर देती है झारखंड तो एक ऐसा राज्य बन चुका है जहाँ सड़क चलते आदिवासी की हत्या फोर्स द्वारा हत्या को महज एक मानवीय भूल बताकर इस मामले को शांत कर दिया जाता है ऐसी स्थिति में जब रुपेश जैसे पत्रकार इन सवालों को लाते हैं सबके सामने लाते हैं लोगों के सामने लाते हैं तब उन्हें उन पर ही दमन किया जाता है उन्हें ही माओवादी या नक्सली या इनका हितैषी बताकर जेल में डाल दिया जाता है जेल में भी उन्हें जेल मैनुअल के हिसाब से खाना भी नहीं दिया जा रहा है इन सब के बावजूद भी न तो रुपेश के हौसले में कमी आई है ना हमारे हौसले में कमी आई हम डरे नहीं हैं हाँ हम परेशान जरूर हो रहे हैं और आखिरकार सरकार हमें परेशान करने के लिए ही तो ये सब कर रही है आप सभी साथियों से मेरा ये अपील है मेरी ये अपील है कि आप हमारा इस लड़ाई में साथ दें और हमारे जैसे सभी लोगों का साथ दें और यूपीए जैसे काले कानून को खत्म करने के लिए एक मुहिम चलाए इस मुहिम को तेज करें थैंक यू Thanks, Ananda, and thank you all. Um, after lunch sessions tend to be a little difficult, uh, but thank you those of you who have managed to stay or come back. Uh, I'll just put a few facts here. These are, like I said, a few facts. There are many more such cases, but I'll just give you a context of the question answer, so we don't have to keep explaining what it is that we're talking about uh, in the duration of this discussion. Uh, the video you just saw, uh, I just like to give a few facts about that case. Rupesh Kumar Singh is an independent journalist from Chhattisgarh. Uh, he was arrested last year by the police and was one of the 40 Indian journalists who was spied on by the Pegasus uh, software, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, multiple FIRs have been lodged against him and his belongings, including mobile phone and uh, laptop, were taken away. Um, <coughs> the police has alleged that he had taken funds. So, address is Chhattisgarh, address is Jharkhand. Jharkhand, sorry. Uh, the police has alleged that uh, he had taken funds from Maoists to put news about them, like paid news, which is quite common in legacy media if you've seen. In fact, there's a story on News Laundry where uh, I could have been featured as a CEO of some something or the other if you pay 8 lakhs uh, by legacy organizations. Uh, in case of uh, Pratik and Alt News, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Muhammad Zubair and the multiple arrests. Uh, that is, you know, going to be a part of what we'll discuss. There are several other such cases uh, which form the environment of how hard it is to be a journalist in today's day and age. And hopefully from these extremely uh, eminent and wise people, we will get some perspective of causes, impact and recourse, if any possible, in that space. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, Narvika, uh, to start with you, uh, <clears throat> in in the case of Rupesh, there are multiple affairs against him, and like was discussed in the panel earlier, some of them have nothing to do with journalism. Uh, what are the kind of defense uh, defense available to him, and how do they really work on the ground as opposed to theoretically what lies in our books, in our law books? What are the kind of defenses would be very difficult to say because I'm not familiar with this case at all. Uh, but typically under the UAPA, many of these defenses will come to light towards the end of a trial. So you suffer more than 10 years in custody and then some court, hopefully the Supreme Court, will take pity on the fact that you've you've stayed so, that long in custody and grants you bail. The law under UAPA is quite draconian. Uh, as far as bail is concerned, uh, we've had a judgment of the Supreme Court called uh, Vatali's judgment, where the Supreme Court has said, essentially, no bail to UAPA under trials, unless 
uh, you're able to uh, prove that there is no prima facie case against you. Um, that is a very difficult so threshold. How does that work? The burden is on you to prove yes, that. More or less, yes. There are a bunch of laws like that. The UAPA, PMLA, the Narcotics, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. Um, and where the onus of proof has somewhat shifted, the bail jurisprudence has been turned on its head. Uh, whereas in all other cases, it is bail, not jail, at least theoretically. Uh, but with respect to these special laws, it is jail, not bail. Uh, until such time as the prosecution can keep shouting that there is a prima facie case against you. And over a period of time, they have become very clever. So they will have different kinds of evidence against you, some of which are completely irrelevant. But the volume of the case is such, as you may be following some of the Delhi riot arguments in the High Court, uh, because it's so voluminous, I think the court gives up and it says, who's going to marshal this? And the best thing is to deny bail. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, well, even in cases where there is no evidence, uh, like in the Bhima Koregaon case, uh, people have been in custody for over four or five years. And it appears the only relief they get is when they go to hospital or they are suffering from some kind of a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. So this is a very clear problem. And um, uh, the only way to counter this is I hope at some stage the Supreme Court listens to the constitutional challenge to these, to these draconian laws. As you know, we've had criminal law turning on its head in, with respect to PMLA. Uh, the uh, recent judgment of the Supreme Court uh, in the B Prevention of Money Laundering Act case adds, adds to the statute uh, certain, um, certain elements that even the statute had not foreseen. If you uh, could just uh, explain the, the PMLA case the for PMLA our audience, where is, the, yeah. they basically they don't have to tell you what they're trying you for, basically, right? If you could just explain a little bit. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, so. The PMLA has a different regime altogether. Uh, a person can be investigated during the stage of inquiry. His statement can be recorded. That statement is admissible in evidence. The Supreme Court has said that. Um, he can then be arrested based on his own statement and the statement of other people. Uh, and uh, they just create a trail, a money trail, which may or may not actually stick. Uh, but uh, again, in, in the case of PMLA, the law is that unless the accused is able to prove that he or she is not guilty of the offense, he or she will not be granted bail. So these are the rigors of these, these provisions uh, where, and you know, the, the challenge to PMLA was also the fact that are the ED officials police officials or not? Because if they are police officials, the general law and the Indian Evidence Act says any statement made to them is hit by the Indian Evidence Act and it cannot be used against an accused person. Um, uh, all of these challenges were, were disallowed by the Supreme Court in really, really tragic judgment which has come out recently uh, where civil liberties and the principle of bail has been turned on its head. Uh, and everything that the state has said has been accepted. So, um, what was the stated objective of this law? We've seen it's been used against journalists or those, you know, speaking up uh, for transparency. With but just what, what was the stated objective? I mean, we know how it's used, but. What is the justification of this? Well, there is prevention of money laundering laws across the world. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, and money laundering at some point was treated as a, as a very um, uh, serious offense. I'm not, I'm not against the stated objective of the law if there's, if there's money laundering and there are uh, ways in which income is concealed in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a manner which uh, which is detrimental uh, to the uh, economic economics of the country. I mean, these are laws which are prevalent across the world. But to uh, make it, you know, the fundamental problem with PMLA is a uh, you you uh, empower enforcement officials uh, with the power 
to record statements of individual accused persons and use those statements against them. Uh, you have in all of these special laws, bail provisions. See, uh, today a police officer, if you know them, they will say, we don't really need to prove the case against you. Uh, we know that the uh, case is sufficient to keep you in for five years and we've, we've attained our objective because after five years you're, you're pretty much useless. Uh, so it is not, it's not that they are, they are investigating or they are preventing money laundering in any robust fashion. Uh, but the problem is that uh, because they have the power to arrest, because the Supreme Court says that whatever they do is absolutely above challenge, um, the, um, the individual con continues to be incarcerated for very, very long periods of time. Uh, and because the bail provision has been reversed from general law in all these special statutes, we have people you can see not just politicians, but individuals remaining in custody for inordinately long period of time. I was actually quite surprised yesterday while I was uh, listening to the Kappan hearing uh, when Mr. Sybil said, oh, there's just one more case against him and that is a PMLA case. Um, uh, and uh, so the order had to be tweaked to, to allow Kappan to take bail in the PMLA case and it remains to be seen whether he'll get bail in that case or not. So, uh, uh, and what kind of money laundering did he do? I mean, they had three, um, three uh, pamphlets which they, uh, which they claimed in court was, uh, was, in, was, in, was in, uh, you know, could incite violence. Those three pamphlets stated facts mm -hmm. that a Dalit girl had been raped, uh, that, she, that her body had been cremated by the police. And there was some random, um, leaflet which was with respect to Black Lives Matter which the public prosecutor said was uh, a toolkit. Uh, <laughs> which has become, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, so these are, these are the kind of words, words you hear very often in court yeah. and, um, uh, and it then was left to uh, both the Chief Justice and Justice Bhatt to say that uh, we find nothing offensive in any right. of this. Uh, and Justice uh, Bhatt went on to say that, you know, treat protests with respect. Remember that uh, the law changed in 2013 after a horrific incident of, ga of gang rape took place in, in Delhi. So you don't have to look at protests because he, uh, what is this thing about protests and incitement the, the to violence? The paranoia of it. Yes. Yeah. So this, but you know, they, they got away with it for two years on the basis of three pamphlets found in his car. And uh, it, so that's, that's really how these laws work. And, and it's scary that, you know, we are, as far as elections go every five years a democracy, but the kind of laws that can actually put you away for no reason uh, exist and are used so frequently and brazenly. Uh, I know we're going to be talking to you about defamation, but before I ask Prateek about the perils of fact-checking, uh, would you like to weigh in on this a little bit because you too are a legal professional? I think it's on. Yeah. So just to add uh, to what Rebecca Ma'am said, I think uh, it is on. Yeah. Yeah. So just to add on to what Rebecca Ma'am said, indeed PMLA is uh, a draconian legislation, and over a period of time, the law has actually lost its objective. Uh, Abhinandan, initially you had asked a question about what was the objective with which this law was enacted. So uh, yes, PMLA was, con uh, money laundering was basically considered to be a global problem. And the reason why it was introduced at the international level and then why the countries were asked to incorporate this law in their domestic legislation was basically to track on the black economy, which was basically terror financing. And, and the like. Now, with time, what has happened is, so uh, just to give a background, PMLA does not get initiated without a scheduled defense. So there has to be a basic offense that a person is charged with. For example, you're charged with cheating. Uh, PMLA comes into picture if you have generated certain money out of that cheating. And PMLA is you have dealt with that money in a particular way. So that's laundering. Now the objective which this, uh, with which this act was enacted was, you know, to stop terror financing. 
but today what has happened is almost all laws under the ipc all even civil kind of offenses have been made scheduled offenses and pmla is now actually being misused to target target any and every kind of offenses for example if we talk about the siddiqui kapun case so um, he was found with pamphlets as far as i have read all the news reports and even the yesterday's recording there was no money that was found there is not even an allegation that he was funded there was just some 45000 rupees sponsorship that he was given to go there now one fails to understand how that 45000 is even a proceed of crime if we say that and then how has it been laundered so pmla actually has lost its objective and the reason why pmla gets invoked more and more against the journalist is because if you charge somebody for defamation right civil or criminal obviously you can't imprison them you can't keep them in prison the second is uapa which again um, un uapa again is as draconian as pmla and it the same twin conditions apply for bail so what are these twin conditions obviously one that rebecca ma'am said that you have to prove so there's a reverse burden of proof where you have to prove that you are not guilty of the offense which is against the basic criminal law that it's a prosecutor who has to establish that you are actually guilty the second very uh, funny i would say condition is that the court has to come to a conclusion that if you are left on bail if you are granted bail you will not commit another offence which is a very speculative condition i mean we fail to understand how any judge can actually or anybody i think kapun himself would not know that whether he can commit any other offence if he is granted on bail so these are those uh, two conditions and pmla usually is uh, brought into picture because of its more draconian provisions and it allows the state to keep a particular journalist or anybody who is accused of that particular offence for a longer period in jail because of these um, twin conditions and obviously i think it's been trailing everywhere that process is punishment in this country you uh, basically keep waiting for your bail hearing and uh, you many a times it happened i mean i was reading a newspaper report some time back where a person where the supreme court had actually you know hauled up the alabad high court because they even refused bail to a particular individual who had completed his entire sentence as a utp so that's the kind of situation that we are li living in so um well it's encouraging to note that you say that it's unlikely someone will be jailed for defamation we'll find out in my case because i have a couple <laughs> uh, soon enough Uh, and so it's otherwise. so uh, in defamation you don't get jailed while you are an under trial prisoner right oh. conviction obviously puts you yeah, let's so it's a we are fair and this is the second is that at least it keeps the internet trolls busy ki news laundry na is kind of the money laundry honestly <laughs> so, so but uh, now without jeopardizing uh, you know i i know since the your colleague zubair has several uh, complaints of fires etc against him um so there's only so much that you can talk about that case but whatever you can do do tell us that um the legally we've been told even in the earlier sessions where we had very uh, eminent lawyers telling us about the laws but in the day to day functioning of you know getting fires getting copies of complaints etc uh, what are the kind of um roadblocks you face and also i read recently that uh, you guys did a fact check on that young cricketer who dropped a catch arshdeep uh, i believe his name and after that a lot of trolls went after him calling him khalistani and all sorts of other stuff many from pakistan but some from india as well and you did a fact check on which were the twitter accounts that were from across the border which were from here and someone has filed an f a complaint against you guys for so the order of things was that arshdeep dropped the catch uh -huh. uh, within the first 10 minutes the multiple people calling him khalistani and somebody saying you know welcome to khalistan so there were somebody who were mocking him and there are people who are sort of uh, abusing him and saying more than khalistani so uh, zubair put out a tweet saying that this is happening and then mr sirsa went and filed a police complaint he was a bjp leader yeah okay and then we fact checked that so and then you fact checked that and he filed a police complaint saying that you are a part of the no, so pakistanis the, the police who complaint saying that we are aiding pakistan in creating a khalistan uh, <laughs> i see yeah. okay so uh, but but some of the other complaints against uh, zubair were equally bizarre so can you just tell us a bit about what is the nature of the complaint and 
where are you now with that and he spent what over two weeks uh, in in custody right 23 23, 23 days yeah three weeks right yeah so uh, the complaints so there are at least two fires where we had fact checked sudarshan news so where they had put out a, a graphic where they show that there's a missile coming and hitting a building uh, and that was uh, some mosque and it was you know so they had morphed that image and that put it out and Zubair fact checked that and there were two FIRs which were filed about that then so another thing where uh, he called Yati Narsingh and hate monger and there was a FIR about that and then uh, there were two more FIRs where he had put out a, a still of a 1983 movie uh, uh, I forget the name of the movie, but it was still of an Rishikesh Mukherjee, Rishikesh movie, yeah. Mukherjee movie. And he had put, put out that still in 2018 and in 2022, apparently that caused uh, disruption in the society. And that is why that was the trigger for the entire balls, setting the ball rolling for, for the complaint against him. No, actually, uh, my understanding is the trigger was why all, the government did what they did was because of the Nupur Sharma video. They, because Zubair put out the Nupur Sharma video and that caused international embarrassment and that is why it has led to this. But the way they played it out was that Zubair had a previous case, which was again a completely farcical case where uh, he, was, uh, he was accused of, uh, he was accused under POXO uh, and where he had put a, somebody abused him and he put a screenshot saying that, you know, you have your daughter's photo in your, in your the slip picture. And he had blurred that. Just, at least don't abuse with your daughter's photo in your display picture. So then uh, there was a case filed against Zubair. Now, on so he was sent a 41A notice in that case. He was already on bail in that case. And the police had given a statement that there is no cognizable offense in his tweet. This Delhi police had already given a... Uh, state in the high court. Now he was given a 41A notice in that case on 24th, 24th or 25th of June, but on 20th of June, in the same police station, another case was filed based on this Hanuman tweet. And despite that case being there, he was not given a 41A notice for this, which I believe is legally necessary. And uh, so he goes. I and we. I thought there was something fishy, so I told Zubay, I'll go with you to Delhi. I've never come with him to Delhi for <coughs> different cases. I told him that I'll go with you to Delhi this time. We go to the police station, and then the thing, you know, we're sitting, I'm sitting down in the waiting room for about five hours, and then finally he comes out, and I see him, and I know that we'll something. Make sure they make good use of the waiting room, five hours. <laughs> huh? mm. yeah. And uh, so he was arrested for this new case, and he was given the 41 in notice right there, saying that, look, there's an a new case against you and uh, and you're not cooperating and that's why we are arresting you and then that started in delhi and then one by one you know cases started coming up in different towns to the point there was a time when you would find out about a new fi in a new town every sort of 36 to 48 to 72 hours and then it was about finding a new lawyer in a new town you know all that things mm -hmm. and what eventually i realized that you know just because we had a certain reach in the society we could have we could do it but yeah. for someone regular you know uh, because we so many people tweeted in in our favor yeah. etc and know. also if just if you're in the metro it makes a big difference yes. like you know the instance we just saw or you know neha had mentioned uh, some other reporters who are in smaller towns who don't get that kind of visibility or who don't have forums like this to to address it yeah. so how much of your time actually goes in fact checking and and journalism these days and how much of it is actually in fighting? So for, for those 23 cases. days, I could not work, you know, I, or okay. I barely worked. Zubair was not working. So the two most, the two senior most people, people in the organization, we were not working. It's yes, we keep, we did stories, you know, the team took up, but the team was also scared because. Absolutely. Know, no, it, it so. I, and that is the desired impact that it has. So uh, Rebecca, you know, when you were introduced, you've had a very long and accomplished innings as a lawyer. How have you seen things change in the last three decades? I mean, have you seen, uh, is it something that we're noticing because we're in the digital age and each arrest is tweeted out uh, or discussed? Or have, have journalists and journalism always needed allies such as yourself in order to survive? You don't, you want to set up a, you know, a news organization, 
she was a journalist later she was a lawyer first uh, has it always been like that no um this is a recent thing uh the uh so back in the day in the 80s when i started practice i can't remember any journalist coming to us with any of these problems even in the 90s uh this is far more recent um in fact back in uh, when i started practice uh i was generally told journalists and lawyers will never be touched uh because they have the potential to really hit back uh so um aside from the i suppose the emergency period but otherwise it was very unusual for journalists to be targeted in this manner of course there was no twitter on uh, those days and there was no facebook and you know the the kind of live tweeting that takes place today uh court proceedings were largely quiet there were no court reporters so one never really knew what was happening till much later um uh sometimes i yearn for that you know i think uh, when everything goes out at the speed with which it goes out and when sometimes you don't have the understanding as to why a particular th- uh, argument was taken or why a particular judge has reacted in a particular way it can have all manner of consequences you know because a lot of people are uh, writing stuff don't necessarily understand uh, court procedure uh, but answering your question it was never like this this is this is the last 15 years or so where i've seen uh it becoming worse uh with every passing day and you like to hazard a guess as to why uh, you think it is i mean it's a ge- <laughs> that's very sweet of you to ask me that question <laughs> <laughs> just just ask <laughs> um yeah we've um things have changed, changed. Okay. right <laughs> <laughs> okay uh Okay, you know i i'd like to open the the floor out when we have about 15 or 20 minutes left so we have enough time for audience questions and statements so will you just give me a, a heads up when we have t- 20 minutes um so uh, i i want to discuss briefly defamation uh, and ip uh there has been a series of strikes uh, i don't know if many of you are familiar with the terminology of youtube videos but if i'm let's say running a youtube channel and i use a video clip that i don't have the intellectual property rights for uh whoever owns that can do a strike against me and three strikes the channel goes those are the youtube rules we in the digital age while the good thing is that uh, the barrier to entry for media organizations has come down as far as cost is concerned many are facing this problem in some cases it is co fair use and you know sonam will tell us what fair use is uh it's clearly defined uh, in in other parts maybe not here but in many cases it doesn't it's not even owned by the people who've done the strike then the people are doing a counter strike so this has happened by at least four members of digipub uh, who have uh, spoken about that and of course um as is the case of of news laundry when we use a video to show that see how terrible this is uh it is i mean of course we have prevailed so far in the with youtube we said this is fair use because if you're going to say how terrible your video is unlike legacy media we will not make up stuff that oh he said this we show you here this is what they did and this is why it's terrible uh now uh and one of the most oldest and often used cases against uh, journalists is defamation that they have defamed you so on first uh, i'll just break it into three one is how is fair use defined in places where it's used more frequently like in the us in india is it defined at all uh and if thought what can one do to make sure that at least the frequency of such cases goes uh, goes down and defamation its usage and what are the implications of it the costs of dealing with it because an organization maybe prateek size or our size which have a lot of public support can finance the legal fight for but maybe smaller youtube channels can't so uh, i'll take the fair use questions first uh, fair use has been defined under the copyright act and there are a set of instances which have been listed which fall within fair use so uh, to first uh, to understand f- fair use i think we'll first have to know that if there is a video if if let's take a video the maker of the video obviously has a copyright license and because of his license he only he only enjoys certain rights to use rebroadcast or use this video further 
Now, fair use doctrine is basically this limitation, uh, which basically allows a person who's not the owner of this particular video to use this video for certain limited purposes without requiring for permission or license or further permission from the person who holds the license, that's who holds the copyright. Now, the, this fair use basically refers to fair dealing. So the expression is fair dealing, which is used. And fair dealing refers to if suppose you're using this video to review or give a critical comment about the video. It's for research purposes. It's for education purposes. Now, uh, it's very difficult to define fair use or fair dealing in a straitjacket formula because it's very subjective. And that's how it has also been defined in different countries, maybe the United States. In fact, we've borrowed our definition from the United States and we follow those same doc uh, the same doctrine. Uh, I'll give you a very uh, simple example of how fair use works. And what are the factors then that weigh with the court to understand whether your use of a particular copyrighted material falls within the dimensions of fair use. So uh, you all must have visited the Delhi University campus. I can tell you about law facts. So there is this famous shop called Dinkar. So what he used to do was, in the prescribed material, there were a lot of international publications, right, where everybody can't buy. They're like a book for 20,000, 30,000. So what he used to do is he started photocopying all these books, binding them and selling them. So then ultimately there was a case which was filed against him for, uh, for uh, copyright violation. And the defense that was taken was that, see, this is fair use because this is for education. So the court said, no, no, this is definitely not fair use because you are deriving commercial benefit out of somebody else's work and you're also disparaging somebody else's copyright, the market value. So the point is that, and there's, there was another dimension to this case. So Delhi University also gave its own prescribed material. So in that prescribed material, obviously, Delhi University also gives you know certain extract pages from that book. That was considered to be fair use. So what is fair use is actually dependent on a lot of factors. For instance, if you're using a particular video only to criticize and review, and the copyrighted material that you've used is not the essence of your work. So for instance, if you talk about news, news laundry, I think what is what is an important factor that will be with court is what is the duration of the video that you have used, right? The copyrighted material. And then what is your add up creative value? So if I have to apply a test, probably will your work get affected if I remove the copyrighted material from your video? Does it take away the value of your creativity or does your create is your creativity so dependent on somebody else's creativity? So that's fair use. And again, there are a lot of factors like duration, what is the nature of uh, work that you have used, how you have used it. And so it's essentially a question of fact. I mean, I can only say that the fair use law is very fair. It allows you to use a copyrighted material fairly. But what is fair is very subjective and it depends on circumstances on how you've used it. So. And, and defamation in journalism, because journalists <clears throat> are you know, calling out those in power, whether it is governance, whether it is bureaucracy, whether it is everything except the judiciary, as we have learned uh, over years. Uh, but uh, so isn't there some element of defaming the person if we use the word loosely in what its general meaning is? Uh, and are we to expect that frequency of defamation uh, cases being filed against journalists? Uh, so see, on I'll start with your last question, which is frequency of filing cases. So nobody can control what somebody else will file. Like, you know, there are a lot of clients who come to us and, and ask, you know, but ye jhuti if I, I mean, ye jhuta case hai, can he still file against me? So I always tell them he can obviously file. He will be able to prove it or not is a separate issue. But you can never stop somebody from filing an action against you. So that is one. Second, as far as defamation is concerned, uh, so when, you know, the society began, there was a theory of social collective. And this theory of social collective, in this theory of social collective, we basically bargain a lot of rights so that the other rights can exist. So defamation, as our constitution says essentially, is a reasonable restriction on somebody's right to freedom of speech and expression. It says obviously you have a right to speak what you want. But simultaneously you do not have a right to defame someone because there's somebody else who has a right to reputation. So it's like balancing rights of individuals who exist in the society. 
when we talk about defamation defamation obviously has certain thresholds and standards where you can say oh somebody has defamed somebody else and there are two kinds of actions that can be take, taken for defamation which is civil and criminal uh, the definition of defamation essentially remains the same under both the libel both kind of laws but the there are certain factors which change like for instance when you file for a civil defamation the person if the person is successful he will have to give compensation where there is whereas there is no such compensation aspect in a criminal action for defamation in a criminal action for defamation intent becomes very very important so you the effect might not have caused defamation but you had an intent to defame somebody is enough to book you for a criminal defamation case whereas civil is concerned you might not have intended but the consequence of your action was defamation is what will weigh in a civil defamation case which is the ultimate consequence so again the essentials of defamation i mean defamation is one obviously you have made a very pointed statement against another individual he was your target you have used words and expressions which may in their ordinary meaning be defamatory and because of your action there has been a damage to his reputation in the reasonable thinking members of the society so that's the parameter and obviously you you i mean once a complaint is filed all these things go to trial and then it's about who and there are a lot of exceptions also which are uh, accepted in defamation which is truth which is i think the most mm -hmm. often taken defense whether it's a civil action or a criminal action for defamation the only difference is in a civil action you can say oh what i said is truth but in a criminal action simply truth is not a defense you have to also establish that the statement that you made was actually in public good and in public interest so that's the other subjective factor so when we talk about uh, laws abhinandan i think uh, the laws are there but the problem is there are a lot of discretions which are available because the uh, there's a lot of subjectivity in all the laws that we have and which there's a lot of constructs which are human constructs there is, there is going to be a we cannot get rid of this subjectivities like sure. you have to give discretion to a judge to be able to come to a conclusion whether a particular thing is defamatory or not and i think this discretion also weighs in all other laws like bail and that is why you know when we make strategies in courts it really weighs with us who's the who's the person sitting on the bench yeah, I, hearing I'd my matter i still so, go with human intervention and algorithms uh, even, even though they've started writing poetry and stuff <laughs> but yeah rebecca on, on this no like on the add. issue of defamation again there's been a shift um when i uh, began practicing law i was told by my senior never uh, get a client to get you to file a defamation complaint tell him he will be defamed even more during trial so that was the that was the yardstick and anyone coming to us saying defamation we'll say pagal ho kya tumhe aur tum aur defame ho jaoge because once uh, it goes to trial and somebody is an accused he has every right to defame you even more in court so uh, it has now become uh, somewhat uh, fashionable to have defamation complaints again it's a very strategic use of section 500 it it's a two year punishment uh it's unlikely any court is even going to give you two years you might be let off on fine or probation or whatever but it keeps so politically i see that aap for example has had to face a slew of defamation complaints ever since they have come uh to power uh they've won most of them but they have been very well occupied in court for the last 8 years or so uh and uh and their lawyers have also been occupied defending these cases uh so it is and sometimes if you lose and you're convicted then that conviction uh, and your appeal you lose the appeal then the conviction also has certain um uh, you know consequences in terms of uh, whether you can contest elections etc cetera, etc cetera. so politically now this I, i'm increasingly seeing uh political parties using uh defamation not just for against journalists but against each other because it keeps them quiet uh uh this was not the case uh earlier uh but a defamation trial can be quite fascinating if you have the um 
if you have the stomach for it, uh, because assume Abhinandan, you are an accused in a, in a case in which you've written against somebody. I mean, imagine the volume of material you can bring out far beyond uh, uh, your original uh, uh, script, uh, all in the defense of truth and in public interest, you know? Uh, so I think in today's time, you just have to think creatively and look at things as they come and say, okay, if I have to face this, I'll face it, but I'll make it worse for the person. Yes, great <laughs> advice. Thank you so much. I mean, whenever I go and lecture at colleges, I'm seeing only enter journalism if you enjoy combat, because only that's what keeps you going. So uh, we have 20 minutes left, is that right? 15, so we'll just open it. I have one request. Uh, I would prefer questions uh, and not comments. However, if you think a comment adds value, feel free. Keep them brief so that we can take as many as possible. Uh, attempt not to go on very long rants, because I will very ruthlessly cut in. Uh, so just think through what you want to say or ask and then articulate that and we'll open it out uh, to the audience. So uh, can I start with this young man in the spectacles? Yeah, meanwhile, just frame what you want to say so we save time. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, in the uh, course Just of introduce this... yourself and who your question is to and if it's to the panel in general, they'll just take it. Yeah. So uh, my name is Kef and I'm a, a LLM graduate and I'm a student of law and technology. So my question is uh, related to that area. So in the course of this discussion, what I identified was that there are a lot of issues, but we tend to see them as separate issues. Like we have uh, copyright being weaponized on YouTube or we have trolls on Twitter. So the larger question is the technological systems that enable all of this behavior in the first place. So if, if the question is related to the technological systems, so is there a possibility for the lawyers and journalists who are aware of such issues to work with engineers? A tech and tech. Yeah, and, and build an alternative technological system that is cognizant of such issues. Good question. I know uh, Pratik has, uh, I mean, in a sense, understands this better than me for sure, but I've heard you talk about this. Is there a tech hack for the kind of, some of the problems that we face uh, when it comes to troll behavior? Surely. So, for example, in the recent, um, you know, the petition, with the US SEC where you know, this uh, whistleblower, Facebook whistleblower, what was the main allegation that in India, uh, there are only four languages which, uh, which have sort of, uh, you know, language classifiers. So, for example, when you use hate speech, all the platforms have very clear uh, policies on hate speech. So, uh, if you look at the Facebook hate speech policy, you will see that Dalits cannot be addressed as this, Muslims cannot be addressed as this. Now, what does that change into language? So, you know, for every language, we have a different expression. Now, how do you automatically figure out that somebody is using hate speech? There's trillions and trillions of bytes of data being, you know, everybody, every day we are posting so much on Facebook, it is impossible to do human monitoring of every single thing. So, which is why these language classifiers come into place. And you now the allegation is that Facebook has only four foolproof language classifiers in India, which means that the other languages, hate speech is not being recognized. And the and same- it's just going freely. Yes, and the same issue happened in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, uh, Facebook did not have a single moderator who underst understood Sinhalese. In case of Myanmar, they did not have a single moderator who understood the local language. So, uh, so th this both technical as well as, you know, both sides. But the answer to that question is that they will never solve that problem. Actually, so it is solvable if they throw sol enough resources at it. Yes, it is. No, it is not 100% solvable, but, but much to an extent. Uh, to an extent, but they will never solve that problem because, so for example, trolls on Twitter, etc. Uh, the, you know, there are so many accounts which get suspended and come back. Those are human decisions that somebody is <laughs> taking. This that's not a technological decision. Human decisions are being taken so that. There are certain trolls on Twitter who exist because the government, you know, once certain trolls got uh, suspended and the government called Twitter to the parliament. So th this is not just a technological question, it's also hey, a political question. Huh? <laughs> uh, okay, we have someone on this side. Uh, okay, uh, let's get the young man here, then we'll come back to you and then I'll come to you as well. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Just identify yourself and I'm glad you've written down your question and all that. Uh, my name is Sean, and I'm a I'm also a former journalist, if I can call myself one. Uh, so my question right now is like in the U.S., you have a law that states that the Fifth Amendment, which says the right to remain silent, that anything that is used against you can be used in the court of law. 
Now, do now with the PMLA that you stated, can, do you have a certain protection in India as well? Leading the fifth, they call it there, right? It's, it's... You can remain silent, but it can be used against you, your silence. <laughs> That's also a problem in India now. One of the, you know, when they, uh, when they uh, oppose bail, for example, if you see order after order of various courts, they'll say so-and-so did not participate in the investigation. Or they'll say that so-and-so came, attended investigation, but his answers were not honest answers. Uh, he did not, uh, uh, he, 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 was, he was beating around the bush, uh, or he was keeping silent. Um, we don't have enough monitoring of this kind of nonsense which goes on. Uh, and in, 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 in some cases, the fact that you remain silent uh, will be used as a circumstance against you. So the robustness of the fifth does not apply in India. Um, so maybe mm. just to add to what Rebecca Ma'am said, in theory, we have right to silence. We have Article 20, Clause 3, which says there's anything that's self-incriminating cannot be used against you. Uh, and this question that you've actually raised with respect to PMLA was actually argued and debated in this much celebrated judgment of Vijay Madan Lal Chaudhary, where the court did acknowledge that a Section 50 statement can be used against a person who's recorded it. But again, whether it violates Article 20 Clause 3 will be a case-to-case -case basis argument which has been left open. So just to answer your question, it, it does exist. And uh, it's followed is another question. <laughs> Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Utsav Mukherjee. I am a lawyer in civil, commercial, and interrelated tech litigation. My question is for Rebecca, ma'am. So, uh, ma'am, you said that uh, in defamation cases, it's often it often happens that the person who files the case or the complaint is then exposed to more defamation in the course of the trial. Now, my question is that if it's if it's such a such an obvious uh, issue. So, uh, isn't there some kind of a safeguard against uh, against uh, such such a problem that at least during the course of the trial, the media may not report on this, or they may report on it to a limited extent because live law and other portals they they report live, so everything's out there the moment something happens in court, like you said in, earlier also. So, is there any safeguard? Is my question. No, if you file a defamation complaint, everything should be def uh, reported, including the fact that you've been. Uh, taken to task. Uh, no, uh, so uh, your question is that why is the defense of the accused reported in in live law, right? Why shouldn't it be? So safeguards are there for certain laws. Obviously, you know, uh, sexual offenses, uh, rape trials, POXO matters, anything relating to children, guardianship matters. If you notice, there are uh, nothing is put up on the website, and those are not uh, open to the public. But I don't think defamation hearings should be subjected to any kind of uh, embargoes. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're open court hearings, and why not? I completely agree. In fact, we are moving. And I mean, to I, a, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> in fact, we are moving to a regime where we want <laughs> live podcast. <laughs> yeah, all exactly. court, proceedings. court proceedings live now. And once you file a defamation complaint, you've put yourself to public scrutiny, yeah. right? So when you filed it, you were already and if, aware and if of you the can, risk. Yeah, prove the guys <laughs> defamed you. Let the, let them deal with the consequences. But why hide? Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, and after that, we'll come to you at the back. Huh? I'm Ashish. Uh, I'm a software guy, but interested in policy and law. So uh, question is to Rebecca, ma'am, and to the panel. So in the Bilkis Bano remission case, uh, the lawyer for Bilkis Bano's side did not manage to get a copy of the remission order. So what kind of, uh, I mean, how does that happen, basically? How is that even possible, right? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. How, like, how? what can we do to prevent yeah, that? Is it mandatory? Is it, I mean... So it depends from... Uh, I, um, it should be given. Uh, I think it's time that we should, uh, we should insist that uh, comments from the victim should be taken prior to remission or, or, or commutation. It was done in Delhi for a while. Uh, and comments were taken from uh, the victim. Uh, 
or the survivor. Yeah, but first, remission order comes after a decision is taken. But even before, at the time when the representation is being considered, the complainant, witness, survivor, whoever it is, his or her views, it is my, my view, should be taken. And a notice should be given to them saying, what are your views? Are there any extraordinary circumstances? Are you still facing any kind of threat, etc.? It may or may not uh, be, uh, be considered valid. Uh, so that's one. And at the end of uh, the process, when the order is passed, I believe the order should be uh, transmitted to the person affected. Do you want to add to that? So, uh, as far as I understand, uh, remission order is actually an executive order which is passed. So, uh, obviously, you can apply for that order and you are entitled to that order if you intend to challenge and apply for a review of that order. Uh, there are there's a process which is prescribed where you can make an application but again if somebody doesn't want to give you an order they'll keep your application pending so you also, so of the problem is in in bill case everybody got to know about it yes but in 90 percent of the cases uh, the case is over uh, the person is serving a sentence uh, the complainant may not even get to get know, to know right. that uh, that particular person's case has come up for extraordinary release or that he has been released. So I think it should be common protocol that A, uh, the victim should be consulted mm -hmm. and B, the order must be mandatorily given. Right. The young lady at the back, yeah. Oh, hi, I'm Ankita. I'm a lawyer in Delhi. Uh, my question is for Rebecca, ma'am, and actually the entire panel. Uh, so as you said, like the purpose with which cases are filed against journalists is often not to prove those ingredients, but to occupy their time, occupy their funds. So A, where do you think the solution to that lies? Do you think there's a possibility of, say, an anti-slap legislation? So should the solution come from legislative change just for journalists and whether you fast track those cases or you reduce the procedural rigors or where do you think the solution to that aspect comes more than the substance of the law is broadly my question okay so um, obviously i think yes anti-slap legislation should be there and if not legislation at, at least there should be certain directives from the court which can act as guidelines the way we had Vishaka, and then subsequently, after two, three years, there came a legislation. Another possible thing that can happen is obviously judiciary will have to become more active. Uh, usually, a defamation case, if I talk about criminal defamation, it's basically a complaint under Section 200. And a magistrate has the discretion to not accept the complaint at the threshold and say, okay, I don't think that there is any criminality which is involved. So I'm not even summoning the other party. I'm not even summoning the accused because at the threshold, I feel that there is no defamation made out from your complaint. So I think that's that's one uh, solution that I see to, uh, you know, probably saving resources of journalists and also saving their time so that they don't have to face frivolous complaints. As far as uh, civil defamation is concerned, I think uh, what basic, so there is a concept called malicious prosecution, um, which I think can also be more actively resorted to by journalists once, you know, they get, uh, but again, for malicious prosecution, I think the requirement is that you have to be acquitted of the charges that have been leveled against you. But yes, it is high time that there should be directives that should be passed. Uh, where, you know, guidelines are laid down so that the problem can be nipped in the bud and the journalist doesn't have to fight the entire trial or the case to uh, get an acquittal or an exoneration. Easier solution is to throw 499 and 500 out of the IPC. Uh, the Supreme Court had a chance to do it. It failed to do it. I don't think criminal defamation should exist in our statute books. Yeah, I, I second that. Yes, uh, the young man there, after that I'll come to the gentleman there and then we'll wind up but yeah okay yeah go ahead uh, hello my name is maknoon wani i'm a researcher with a think tank in delhi uh, my question is to prateek specifically because uh, when we talk about uh, digital ecosystems we talk about fake news hate speech etc cetera, etc cetera. we know that organizations such as uh, alt news or international organizations such as bellingcat there's so much only so much uh, ground that they can cover with regards to fake news and all this stuff so uh, do we only rest the responsibility of controlling these things on Facebook, private entities, and the government by introducing policies? Don't, we, don't you think that we should also have a bottoms-up approach? Maybe introduce a curriculum what in the schools? 
स्टार्टिंग क्लास सेवन एट नाइन एंड ऑल्सो The other plan uh, is to work for in community education. Those are the two plans that we have, and we are hoping that within the next two years or so, we will have a school curriculum which will be functional at least in some schools, creating a model of sorts. But even the first question that you asked, you know, the problem is that. Uh, so I'll give a simple example. Uh, you have Op India, and then you have a fact checker, some fact checker associated with Facebook. Now, what is Facebook's? uh misinformation policy that if an organization puts out repeated misinformation then their page rank should go down right now here there's op india whose page rank keeps going up while if you go to a typical fact checker who's associated with facebook they'll have 5 likes 6 likes 10 likes well there's is the metric is engagement and not accuracy basically what facebook is doing exactly so facebook's basic you know the whole reason and you'll see mark zuckerberg going to every second interview saying that we have independent fact checkers we have independent fact checkers but where is the impact you know so they are basically using this whole fact checking ecosystem at least facebook is doing that as a pr thing that oh we have independent fact checkers but where is the impact the most you know or if you look at all the propaganda outlets there you know they their reach is still and that is know, because the facebook metric is engagement rather than and that is the case with every platform so okay. there are solutions at platform level as well but but nobody is addressing that but yeah i mean in general yes of course society should do better but society typically does better when you know people who have larger impact do better which is why i think you know pakistan keeps coming up with fast bowlers because they had imran khan and we keep coming with batsmen because we had gavaskar so yeah uh, we have a young man here there there he is the young man in specs that's the last question uh okay fine one more because yes. that gentleman has saved me a trip to chandigarh but yeah go ahead Yeah, so we are discussing a lot of laws like UAPA and PMLA and all such. So the responsibility is more on the executive, like to do the interrogation, put up the case in the court of law, right? So don't you think there needs to be a requirement that the Supreme Court should set up some guidelines for the executive head of the state, like it did in the Arunesh Kumar case for other executive branches like ED and CCI and such? Uh, and you are a law student or journalist? Yes, I am a law student. Law student, okay. Great, thanks. Uh, last question we take there. Uh, Rebecca, you want to take that? Is that possible to do? Guidelines. Mm -hmm. We've had so many guidelines which <laughs> they don't work. Um, no, I think these laws just have to go, and I hope maybe during your lifetime they will go. I hope. I don't think it'll go during my lifetime. These laws just have to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Abhinandan, my question is to you. I was here for a book launch, and because of a law session, as a lawyer, I have been. I I thought I'll I'll watch this session, so I'm accidentally here. But after hearing the discussion, my question is to you: Are you sure that the journalism has reached to a stage where you are so disciplined and so honest that there should be no actions taken against the journalists? absolutely not i think that is a ridiculous uh, you know expectation by anyone that there should be no uh, you can't have no action taken against forget journalists against anyone uh, i think the laws that exist have to exist for all it is just that because the kind of impact journalists have they tend to be targeted in a sense to the intended consequence is very different from the unintended consequence or the stated the stated objective is different from the unstated objective so for that reason uh, i think um, especially the way the assault comes on journalists uh, there has to be there should be some sort of a recourse in an ideal world if if uh, you know laws worked the way they supposed to we wouldn't need to have this discussion at all then the session should have been more balanced it was so biased only for a particular cause it should have been a more balanced session where there has to be a discipline that should also be imposed on the content and the manner you project the news and so as to give a, a very 
you know, uh, the law on one side taking action and law should be taking action otherwise. Well, I think right now the country I live in, I'm not sure about the one you're in, uh, the bias is so overwhelmingly the other way, I'd be happy to provide a counterbalance on this side. However, if I lived in an environment where the counterbalance was completely outsized that journalists, uh, where I could walk into the IT office and raid the IT officials, then I think this session should have been done by IT officials saying, how dare Abhinandan Sekri walk into my office and take my phone and laptop. But right now, because the country I live in, it is my phone and laptop that is taken away without any explanation being given to me. I think the bias requirement from the few of us who are pushing back has to be the other way. Because in the world, Santulan Zaruri hai. Or Santulan provide karna, sab apni apni tara se karta hai. <coughs> so, I, I, we will we'll take this offline. So, no, we'll, we'll take this offline. I, I got to wind up, bro. I, I, I really got to wind up. So, so, yeah, go ahead. The Santulan is that two years ever since I have stopped watching news or reading newspapers, the India is a good country. Neither there is any problem, nor there is any bias. That is ignorance. <laughs> Actually, but you know, sir, I'm not joking. Our team that actually reviews news, the prime time, uh, we have to change the research team every three months. I'm not joking because it's too much uh, mental stress and, and it just gets to them that hate dealing with on a daily basis. But I will wind up. Thank you for all, thank you all of you for your, uh, for your attendance, for your indulgence, for your questions. And before you clap, I have something to say. We have another session after this which will be introduced. But uh, the three organizations that are represented up here, one is, uh, young man, I'm still talking, right? Uh, so uh, one is Alt News. Uh, the session before us spoke a lot about the corporatization of news, ads taking over before that government funds used to run news. So Alt News, News Laundry and Internet Freedom Foundation, and also Hartosh Bal's caravan run on subscription. So next time you're sitting with a group of friends saying, a buddy study news, they'll say, I have a great solution, say what? Open any of our sites and say, chal subscribe kar. Theek hai? To 10,000 kamar hai, 300 de de. 1 lakh kamar hai, 10,000 de de. Okay, so unless you guys step up, stop whining. And if you want to whine, then watch Arnab. Okay, so there's, there's Internet Freedom Foundation, there's Alt News, there's News Laundry. Put your money where your mouth is. And also, uh, you can contribute in other ways, seeing the wonderful products we make outside. Uh, and show your support in whatever way you can. Thank you, thank you all.